Hello and welcome. This is uh, a set of solutions to recitation activity four. Um, this is primarily being made for one of our recitation TAs who is um, wasn't able to attend the recitations due to a last minute uh, situation um, this Tuesday. And so I'm gonna make this these solutions available to everybody in the class. Um, and I just wanted everybody to know that the reason why we get a video here for this recitation is um, two of our groups weren't able to meet today in person. Okay, so question one, which compound is incorrectly named? And so for naming chloric acid, that would have to be the acid derived off of chlorate. So this is the chlorate, so this would be chloric acid. So HClO3 would be chloric acid, not HClO4. So A is incorrectly named. Um, B is correctly copper sulfate, copper one. So copper one is copper with a plus charge. We would need two of those to balance out the two minus sulfate ion. Butane is C4H10, so we have four carbons as butane. Three is propane, two is ethane, one is methane. So butane would just have four bonds on each carbon. And so if we count up hydrogens in every spot here, that'd be C4H10. Then HPO4, two minus is the hydrogen phosphate ion. Now, why is it two minus? Well, we take an H plus, add it on to the phosphate formula, and we get the two minus charge. And so then we would need two potassiums to balance out to be neutral and charge. So two pluses for the two minus ion. So K2HPO4 is potassium hydrogen phosphate. If we had potassium dihydrogen phosphate, that would be KH2PO4, where the dihydrogen phosphate ion is H2PO4 with a minus charge. Now once you get to H3PO4, then we name this for being an acid. Once you're neutral and charge, by adding the H pluses, then this is what we call an acid in our nomenclature system. Moving on to the next question, write a proper balance for the combustion reaction for um, octane. What is the coefficient of CO2? So I have C8H18. Hydrocarbons plus O2 combust to form CO2 and water. To put this reaction into balance, the plus sign a little bit here. We would have eight CO2s, I'd have nine waters, then I'd have 16 plus nine for 25 oxygens. And so I'd have to have like a fraction here. And usually we don't do fractions in a proper balanced reaction. So let's get rid of the fraction and double our octane. And so then we're going to double to 16 CO2s for 16 carbons. We're gonna go to 18 waters. So we have 36 hydrogens on both sides. And then we're going to, have, so that would be 16 times two, 32 plus 18 is 50 O's now on both sides. And so 50 O's is accomplished with, of course, 25 oxygens. So we have 50 O's on both sides, and proper number of C's and H's as well. And so the coefficient in front of CO2 is 16. Next question, number three, we have the reaction here, S plus 2F2 goes to SF4. What type of reaction is this? This is a combination. So anytime we're doing an A plus B going to C, this is a combination. And so we can have multiple coefficients, that's fine. We can have a coefficient even in front of our product, that's fine. The key is just having an A plus B goes to C. So even 2A plus 3B goes to 4C would be a combination reaction. So even this one would be a combination. Decomposition is the opposite. It's the A going to B plus C. Again, you can have multiple coefficients. And combustion is the previous one we saw on the other page. So when water is the products. Question four, the percent sodium and sodium carbonate. The percent sodium would be two times the atomic weight of sodium, which is 23.00 AMU. Divide by the formula weight of Na2CO3. This can be about 23 times 2. So 23 times 2 plus 12.01 plus 16 times 3 is 106.0. So the percent, so we got to multiply by 100%. So 2 times 23 divide by 106.0 is 43.4%. So if you know the percent C, or like, let's put it this way. If you know you can get the percent sodium, the percent C, and the percent O 
from knowing the formula, you should be able to take the percentages and get the formula for some other type of compound. So when we give you the percent, you know, Na percent C percent CO3, if we give you the percentages, you should be able to work back to the formula. Well, I think we'll see an example of that in a minute. Now, which substance below contains the most atoms? Well, one mole of S8 contains eight sulfur atoms. Because each mole, well, let's put it this way. This is not the proper math. So one mole of S8 contains eight moles of sulfur atoms. So if we're working out the number of atoms in S8, in one mole of S8, I might be doing this conversion here. I say, well, one mole of S8 contains eight moles of S. One mole of sulfur contains an Avogadro's number, S atoms. So we have a huge number. We have eight times Avogadro's number. Number of atoms of sulfur and one mole of S8. Now, if you have one mole of ammonium phosphite, we'd have five times three, 15, plus four, 19 moles of atoms. So one mole of ammonium phosphite contains 19 moles of atoms. So we're gonna have 19 times Avogadro's number of atoms within the one mole of ammonium phosphite. And then lastly, if we look at aluminum sulfate, we have a bunch here, but not more than in B. So in Al2SO43, we're gonna have five times three, so that's 15 plus two, so 17 moles of atoms. So the most atoms are present in the sample in this problem for ammonium phosphite. Now, one mole of all substances don't have the same number of atoms. They have the same number of molecules. So a mole of any substance has Avogadro's number of that formula. So one mole of, say, CH4 contains 6.022 times 10 to the 23 CH4 molecules. You have one mole of, say, aluminum sulfate, Al2SO43, then this contains 6.022 times 10 to the 23, I often say units or formulas of Al2SO43, simply because your ionic compounds don't exist in molecular form like your molecular compounds do. And so, you get the molecular nature of molecular compounds, you get kind of units of the formula, but it's the same basic idea. It's just the vocabulary is slightly different. Question six, how many grams of fluorine are present in 705 grams of SNF2? Um, so if we have, we can do this with dimensional analysis, number of grams of fluorine in this sample would be 705 grams for SNF2. We could use the molar mass of SNF2 that's given here. 156.7 grams per mole of SNF2. We go to moles here because we know one mole of SNF2 contains two moles of F. And we know one mole of F in the periodic table, if we look at it, 19.00 grams. And so then that, that's our last two conversions. One mole of SNF2 contains 156.7 uh, grams of Oh, I just wrote the molar mass again. What am I doing? So one mole of SNF2, two moles of F, times one mole of F, and that's atomic weight, 19.00 grams. So 705 divided by 156.7 times 2 times 19. So that's 171 grams. You could also have done this problem slightly differently. You could have said, well, 705 grams of SNF2 times the percent F and SNF2 by mass. So we could have worked out the percent F. If you notice the percent F would be this calculation here. It would be two times the mass of F divided by the formula weight. So another way you could think through the problem is just the mass of the compound times the percent F and SNF2 will give you the mass of just the F. How many fluorine atoms are in the sample? Um, let's use that mass from the previous example. Um, it's 171 grams of fluorine, because we're really asking how many 
atoms of F or in 171 grams of fluorine. And so we can just go back to moles. We can use 19.00 grams per mole of F. And then one mole of F contains 6.022 times 10 to the 23 F atoms. And I get 5.42 times 10 to the 24 atoms. So that's going to be fluorine atoms at full. 705 grams sample of SNF2 contains. So when iron carbonate is heated and decomposes, um, what is the coefficient of CO2 in the balanced reaction? Well, this is one of those decomposition reactions. So Fe2CO3,3. So this is iron 3 plus, carbonate 2 minus. When this goes to Fe2O3, this is still iron 3 plus. This is still the two minus oxide ion. So we haven't changed the charges here. Our CO2 comes off as our product. I wouldn't worry too much about the physical state, but it goes off as a gas here. And so we're gonna get three CO2s off to put everything in the balance. So coefficient should be three in front of CO2 in this balance reaction. A mineral contains this percent CO, or excuse me, uh, this percentage copper, um, iron and sulfur by mass. So if we know these percentages by mass, we should be able to work out a formula. So if I know that a given sample, if I write correctly, is 34.6 grams of copper and present to a ratio of 30.4 grams of iron and ratio to 34.9 grams of sulfur. I can use really whatever masses I want as long as we keep these ratios intact. And so of course keeping the ratios intact is easiest done, most easily done by changing those percentages to grams. So we just want to keep the ratio of the masses true for the sample in this particular ratio. And then we use their individual molar masses. So for copper, that's what I usually have to look up. 63.546 per mole copper, iron 55.845 and 32.06 grams per mole of sulfur. And then we get our moles out for this sample. Now, unless we get lucky, these aren't gonna come out to be whole numbers right off the bat. I get 0 0.544 moles of copper in ratio to 30.4 divided by 55.845, 0 0.544 moles of iron, so it looks like however many coppers we have are equal to the moles of iron in the formula. 34.9 divided by 32.06 goes to 1.09 moles of sulfur. And so if we can't see the whole numbers, like I can kind of see that this is going to be, you know, 1 to 1 to 2, just by virtue, I can kind of tell without even doing the math that there's twice as much sulfur here in moles. But if you can't tell... If you're not sure, what we would do here is just find the smallest and then divide all of them by the smallest quantity. Now, the reason why I like to make sure that we're approaching these as ratios, I can't divide one by one number and another by a different number. They have to all be divided by the same number or I break the ratio. So I divide them all by the same number, the smallest one. I still don't always get whole numbers. I do in this example. Like, I'm going to get one mole, of course, for copper and ratio to one mole of iron to um, two moles of sulfur. 1.09, I mean, I could, you can probably see this. 1.09 divided by 0.544 is 2.003. So this clearly routes the two. So copper, iron, S2 would be our formula. 
Now, when I was mentioning you don't always get whole numbers, like what do you do here if this had come up out to be in some other example, let's say 1.50? Well, then we're just looking for multiples. We're trying to say, do we need to multiply all these by two, by three, by four? We're obviously starting with one. In this case, we didn't have to change them at all. So multiplying by one, the default number, is what we're really doing at first. And so the first example, we just multiplied them all by one. We didn't have to change them. But if that doesn't work, we're doubling, tripling, quadrupling, quintupling. You're probably not going to see a lot of test questions that get out to this point here where you're, you know, having a hard time figuring out what the multiple is. But you got to multiply by a whole number. Because if you don't have a whole number, that number one is not going to be a whole number. Okay, so we're looking for multiples if we don't see whole numbers. So if it's 1.50, we're doubling. If one of them is about 1.33, we're going to need to triple all of them. If one of them is like one and a quarter or something in a quarter, we're going to have to quadruple. Hope you get what I'm saying there. Okay, so then oftentimes if you have a molecular compound, like let's say we determine an empirical formula from for C3H4O from some experiment. So if I have the percent C, the percent H, the percent O data, the best I can get is the empirical formula. But usually we want to know the molecular formula. So then we just do another experiment where we get the molecular weight and find out what it is and then we can find the molecular formula. So we get the multiples of the empirical formula by taking the molecular weight and dividing it by the empirical formula weight. So we take the molecular weight here, 336.4 AMU, and I divide that by 12.01 times 3 plus 1.008 times 4 plus 16 by 56.06. 336.4 divided by 56.06 is 6. And so we have six multiples. And if for some reason we don't get really close to a whole number here, we probably made a mistake in some determination somewhere. Like if we had to find the empirical formula and we're doing this math and we're getting a fraction here, we probably want to double check the empirical formula steps and see if we determined it incorrectly. But we should always get a whole number here. We've done the problem correctly. Um, so then we need to take our C3H4O times six for all of these. Otherwise we break the ratio. So c 8 C18, H2406. Two moles of phos, uh, two moles of P4, 10 moles of O2 react, combination reaction. Uh, but how much P4O10 forms when the reaction is complete? So this problem here doesn't say to evaluate which is the limiting reactant and which is the excess reactant. We have to know to do this. So we have to go find the limiting reactant here, even though it doesn't say to, because we have given two and a half moles to 10 moles. Well, for every one mole of phosphorus, I need five moles of oxygen. So if I'm reacting all this P4, if all two and a half moles reacts, I need times five of this quantity in the form of oxygen. That's going to be 12.5 moles of O2, but I don't have 12.5 moles of O2, I only have 10. So O2 has to be my limiting reactant. We're gonna find P4 as the excess reactant. So when we're given moles here, it's pretty easy to tell which is the limiting versus which is the excess. And so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna calculate the number of moles of P4O10, consuming all the O2, 10.0 moles of O2. For every five moles of O2, we produce one mole of P4O10. And so that's going to give us two moles of the product. Now, we can do this, you know this is the right answer because this is the limiting reactant. Now, if you're saying, well, I don't understand or maybe you didn't follow my determination of the limiting versus the excess reactant, then just do it again. And if we were wrong, we'll catch our mistake, but I don't think we're wrong. But we could always double check running through consuming all of the excess reactant or the other reactant if we're not sure. So I take all the P4 and for every one mole of P4, we would get one mole of P4O10, which of course is going to give us 2.5 moles of P4O10, where I only get two moles of P4O10 from consuming all the oxygen. So we have to remember we're consuming the oxygen and we're producing the product, just like we're trying to consume the P4 and producing our product. 
But as soon as we get to two moles of P4O10, the oxygen is gone. I have none left. I don't have enough oxygen to get to two and a half moles. So we're evaluating whichever one gives us the lesser quantity. So the lesser quantity is our most product we can possibly make in this reaction. We can't get to two and a half moles. We can't get to any greater moles than two for P4O10. How many grams of HCl are produced by 1.23 grams of titanium chloride reacting with excess water? Um, so we're told we have an excess. 1.23 grams here. If I ever write out my mass in grams, I don't want to write this as my B table. I mean, it is the before, but I want to write this in moles. Or molecules, but moles works probably better in this example. So titanium uh, is 47.87. plus 35.45 times four. So 189.67 grams per mole. So if I convert to moles, 1.23 divide by, oh dang it, 1.23 divide by 23 divided by second answer. So this is 0 0.00648 moles. So now my BCA chart gets a little tricky here because I'm starting with this. And I don't really have to do the BCA chart, but I just wanted to show one here. And so I'm going to write my reaction again just so we can see the different substances. Clearly, so the, it, the with the BCA chart is you can write minus x, so we're losing our reactants, but we're losing twice as much water from the coefficient in here. So TiCl4 plus 2 water, so it's minus 2x because of the 2, minus because they're both reactants, and then we're gaining x and gaining 4x on our product side. So 4x on HCl because of the 4 in front of HCl, and just x because of 1 TiO2. And so um, if we consume all of our limiting reactant, we're told we have an excess, meaning we have some leftover water. So water's our excess reactant. Then X is what we're producing on TiO2. Um, and so, uh, and, and then we're getting four times the number of X. So we're getting four times X in the case of HCl once the reaction finishes. And X would be equal to 0 0.00648 that value has to be subtracted to get zero. So X would be equal to 0 0.00648 moles. So four times X would be 0 0.0259 moles of HCl. And so then HCl is one point zero zero eight plus thirty five point four five so that's thirty six point four six grams per mole and so that's going to be zero point nine four four grams I probably didn't properly round something or maybe cut something off too soon but point nine four six looks like the closest answer and I bet we'll get that more dead on if we do this an alternate way, if we use the metal analysis to get our grams of HCl, let me make this smaller, make the pen size smaller. So we start with our given 1.23 grams of TiCl4. We use the molar mass, 189.67 grams per mole of TiCl4. We use a conversion from our reaction for every one mole of titanium chloride. We produce four moles of HCl. And then one mole of HCl is 36.46 grams. And I'm just curious if we do this math, if we get dead on. And we do. So 0 0.09, or not 0, 0, 0 0.946 grams showing our correct calculation here. Now, we just rounded a bit of, you know, I think by rounding this to three sig figs, if I kept an extra digit, we would have gotten exactly the 0.946 out here. So I just wanted to see that was just some rounding errors on our calculation with the BCA chart. So we can go to the BCA chart, 
which is fine, a little bit longer, I think, but I think has some good conceptual understanding if we know how to set one up. And then we can just use dimensional analysis, though, for a shorter set of math to get our answer. Two moles of Fe2O3, six and a half moles of carbon are reacted. Our yield is 3.64 moles of iron. What's the percent yield of the reaction? Well, we'll just think of it this way. And I think with our nice coefficients here, like the fact that we're given moles and we have a one to three to two reaction here. So think of how many moles of iron you would get if you consume all of the Fe2O3. If we have two moles of Fe2O3, for every one mole, we get two moles of iron. So we would have four moles of iron produced. So two moles of iron react, we get four moles of iron uh, produced. So if you have two moles of Fe2O3 react, that is. So two moles Fe2O3, if these are to react, for every one mole, we get two moles of iron. So we would get four moles of iron produced. If I have 6.50 moles of carbon that are reacted fully in the reaction, for every three moles, I get two moles of iron. So for every three, I get two moles of iron. So 6.5 divided by three times two is 4.33. So once I get the four moles of iron, I've lost all of the first reactant, so I can't get the 4.33. So our theoretical yield or sometimes the max yield is four moles. And so my percent yield is 3.64. My actual yield that's given in the problem, divide by four moles times 100%. And so that's gonna work out to be, I think 91%, 3.64 divided by four, yep, 91%. So then we have a sample that contains CO2 and water, um, or excuse me, we have a sample that contains CHNO, the element CHNO, it's completely burned, produces so many grams of CO2 and water. So we're trying to work out the formula. So we don't know these coefficients, but we know that all the carbon goes to CO2, all the hydrogen goes to water, and all the oxygen we get by difference. So what we're gonna do is try to work out the number of grams of carbon and CO2, that's the carbon mass for our sample. And then we work out the number of grams of hydrogen and water. And so if I take my CO2 mass, 16.6 grams of CO2, we're gonna multiply this by the percent C in CO2. And then we take the water mass as 6.80 grams of water times the percent H in water. And the percent C in CO2 would be 12.01 divided by 44.01, just one carbon mass divided by the formula weight, 44.01. And so that's gonna be 16.6 times 12.01 times 44.01. There's ways to make this step look longer, but let's not break our backs here. Let's let's recognize that we know the percent C. The percent C in CO2 is a very simple equation. So you can make this step, this calculation take longer, but this is just the percent C in CO2. So it's the one carbon mass times, you know, carbon mass times one formula weight of CO2. Same thing for percent H in water, it's gonna be two times 1.008 and then divide by uh, 18.02 is the percent H and water. So two waters divided by 18.02. So 6.80 times 2 times 1.008 divided by 18.02. I said 0 0.761 grams of hydrogen. And then our grams of oxygen is just subtracted off. We take our sample mass that contains CH and O. Subtract off your grams of C, subtract off your grams of H, this is your number of grams of oxygen. So go 11.3 minus 4.53 minus 0.761 gives me 6.009 grams of oxygen.
And these are just in a ratio to each other, and then we just do the 12.01 grams per mole of carbon times 1.008 grams per mole of hydrogen, and then times 16.00 grams per mole of oxygen. Just getting our ratio of our atoms, 4.53 divided by 12.01, 0 0.377, Point seven six one divided by one point zero zero eight point seven five five and then that's present in ratio to the moles of oxygen six point zero zero nine divided by sixteen zero point three seven six moles of O. So you can see your C to O ratio looks the same, but you know these are within experimental error, the same values and 0.755 divided by 0.377 works out to be 2. So we divide these by 0.376 and this one's approximately 1, this one's obviously directly equal to 1, and this one's equal to 2. So CH2O is the empirical formula. So the best we can do from this information is an empirical formula. We want the molecular formula, we just need to know the molecular weight. Okay, so then just a couple naming questions to wrap up. Barium phosphate is barium 2 plus. Phosphate is a 3 minus. So we have 3 and 2. So we're remembering 4 and the 3 minus are what we have to know for phosphate. Barium's in the calcium group, so we know its charge is like calcium magnesium plus 2. And so we're just making our charges equal each other to have a charge neutral compound. So BA. 3 PO42. Just remember PO3 is phosphite. So if you lose an O, you go to ite. So 8 is PO4. And then which compound or formula does not represent a stable compound? Now a stable compound is just one that we can name and the charges are properly balanced. So this would be sodium peroxide. Why is it peroxide? Well, I have pluses, two of them. I have an overall O2 minus 2, and that's just the name of peroxide ion. Calcium ClO2 has the wrong formula. Ca ClO2 is a minus, so we should have two of these with the two plus. So this would not represent a stable compound. We need a two here. Rubidium phosphate makes sense. Rubidium's like potassium, sodium, it's a plus. Three of them, phosphate's a minus. This is sulfite, uh, SO4 two minus, two H pluses, so this would be sulfurous acid. So if we had a formula like H HSO3 or HSO4, let's say you had the same question, is HSO4 represent a stable compound? The answer is no, because it should be H2SO4. HSO4 would be stable with a minus charge. So think of things that you can name, the things that we know how to name, we're taking for granted as those being stable formulas. All right, guys, that is uh, all for this video. Um, Sorry we weren't able to, to have all our recitations this week meet in person, but hopefully this video uh, walks you through the problems. I don't think most recitations were completing this activity anyway, so like I said, I'll post this for all of our classes to be able to see in case anybody just wanted to see a set of solution videos to the problems. All right, have a great, great afternoon or day, whatever it is you're, whatever it is you're watching this.